Welcome back to Supreme Myths. I am honored today to have one of the most prominent constitutional law professors in the world here with me, and I've been wanting to talk to this person for a long time um, in, a, in an extended format. Uh, Michael McConnell is the Richard and Francis Mallory Professor of Law and Director of the Con Law Constitutional Center at Stanford Law School. He went to the University of Chicago. It might surprise some to know he clerked for Justice Brennan, uh, something he has in common with retired Judge Posner, who I have to mention at every podcast, otherwise uh, I feel bad. Um, Michael worked in various positions in government, went into academia, then became a judge for the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals from 2002 to 2009. Uh, before returning back to Stanford. He has written more articles, essays, op-eds, and books than we could possibly mention. But his latest book, which we will talk about uh, in this podcast, uh, which I'm very excited, I'm not ready yet, but I'm very excited to, and I will be reading it soon, is um, The President Who Would Not Be King, Executive Power Under the Constitution. It's a great title. Couldn't be more timely. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Uh, thanks. This will be fun. It's nice to have you one on one. You and I have shared a couple of conferences at San Diego, either virtually or in person. But um, now I get you all to myself, which I'm excited. about. So I want to start off by talking about originalism, um, which has been occupying my mind for the last 10 years. And I assume your mind for a lot longer than that. I assume you self-identify as an original. It's a dumb question, but I want to make sure. Yeah, I was actually just writing briefs and articles as an originalist, not realizing it was a thing <laughs> before it became a thing. Okay. So it just seemed to me to be the natural way of understanding a document that was written 230 some odd years ago. So I have read your work from the 19, I think, 80s until today. Uh, and I'm not exactly where you fit in in today's world of originalism. So we had the original originalists of Berger and, and, and um, Bork, um, and then we jumped from that to new originalism, new new originalism, original methods, originalism is our law, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not sure where you fit in, to be honest. Where do you, uh, maybe you don't, to those categories? Well, you know, it, it is true that it's become uh, kind of like, theology and maybe in a hyper protestant way where you have a constant church splits um and you know i'm not quite i don't really care very much about where whether i fit into one camp or another this is the way this is the way i look at it uh, the the constitution and most laws and a lot of other things are written for a reason they were adopted by the people and so uh, what matters is what did it mean to the people who had authority to uh, to adopt it? Now, you know, maybe we shouldn't be paying attention to an old constitution anyway, but if we are going to pay attention to the old constitution, we ought to find out what it was understood to mean at the time. But I consider that a primarily historical exercise, an exercise in intellectual history. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a little bit at odds with the modern turn, or actually it's not so modern anymore, 20 years ago, turn in, interp in originalist interpretation for a hyper-linguistic uh, approach. The way to understand the Constitution, I think, is to ask what it's about. Uh, you, you, you look at a particular provision, for example, you might look at the take care clause uh, in this in Article Two, telling the president that he has a duty to take care of the, the laws be faithfully executed, and you don't look up the word "take" and the word "care" uh, and so forth. What you do is you look at the history that was behind this, and you see that James the Second, who was uh, abhorred by our founders, was tossed out as king when he refused to enforce. Uh, certain acts of Parliament, and the first two provisions of the English Bill of Rights of 1860, I'm sorry, 18, uh, uh, 1688, uh, prevent the king from suspending and dispensing with laws. And that's what, that's how we know what the Take Care Clause is doing. Uh, now, is that original public meaning? I think it is, because I assume the public also understood that the Constitution was there for a reason. Every little bit of it has a history, and that's really, that's, in my view, how we figure out what it meant. 
So what do we do, Michael? Let's, let's take the take care clause as an example. Whatever they thought it meant in 1789 or before or shortly thereafter, that was not a world where, for example, the president of the United States can destroy the planet with a couple pushes of a button. button. And it's not a world where we had a Great Depression and our whole system of our whole relationship between the federal and state governments changed. And how do we take, we, let's say we agree on what the original meaning is, but then we have all of these changes. And, and this is where I think we get a little bit in trouble when we start demarcating originalism from living constitutionalism. But before we get to that, what do we do with those changes? I mean, a world where the president can destroy the world in an hour is a different world than George Washington inhabited, a very different world. Well, you know, that's certainly true. I, I, l- let me be clear about this. Yeah. Um, I, I don't write this book on the assumption that everyone is going to be an originalist. This is sort of what I ask. <laughs> Let's try to figure out what the Constitution actually means. And then if there are really good reasons to depart from it, let's talk about that. But let's be candid about it. Let's not pretend that what, you know, five of the nine justices on the Supreme Court wish were in the Constitution. Let's not pretend that that's the Constitution. If we want to depart from it, uh, okay. Now, I actually think if we have a serious conversation about that, that we will not want to depart from it uh, at least not very often and not without a lot of practice and, and precedent uh, in between. You talk about the dangers of the president being able to blow up the whole world. That's true. But our Constitution, if we paid attention to it, gives Congress the authority exclusively to take us into war. It is the practice of the last 30 to 40 years under both Republican and Democratic administrations that allows the president the kind of latitude uh, to uh, to take us into war, uh, the, the framers of the Constitution specifically uh, prohibited. Um, and, and, and don't imagine that this is an ideological thing. Uh, you know, presidents of both parties did this. Obama took us into war against Libya with no congressional authorization, and I have never seen an adequate explanation either for how that comports with the Constitution or why that would be a good occasion to depart from the Constitution. It just seems to me a a clear case where if we were all originalists, we would have been better off. Yeah, I I agree with that. And I'm I'm not good at math, but I think it's been more like 50 or 60 years since the since presidents have have done have done the the least. I I hate to admit that I'm that old. Um, So this is where I really want to I really want to get to the bottom of this with you, because I am sincerely confused by your work in one specific regard. Uh, I, I was just reading your Boston University Law Review lecture on time, institutions, and judicial review. And I've read a lot of your work about judicial deference, judicial modesty, judicial humility. And I've told you this before, and now I want to tell the whole world. I started teaching in 1991. Your work had an enormous influence on it. It really did. Um, in, in terms of my skepticism about judges. So I read that part of your work, and I'm, I'm going to quote you, if you don't mind, um, from that article, where you basically say, I use the term judicial restraint to mean the disposition of the courts to uphold the constitutionality of acts of the political branches when there is no clear, base, clear basis in constitutional text, history, or practice to the contrary. Something I agree with 100%. I have several questions about I want to first mention Michael Rappaport to you. Michael's an originalist, without a doubt, but his position is if a judge is 51, 49% sure, I know that's kind of crazy to begin with, but if a judge is just this much more sure than not that the original meaning should invalidate a statute, a judge should invalidate the statute. I find that horrific. Um, and I'm, I, I, to me, if you're 51, 49, you say, you know what, I'm not sure the elected, let the voters decide. And that's where I thought you were. But maybe I'm wrong about that. No, that's not where I am. Okay. Because I'm not even sure that's a coherent way of thinking about it. Oftentimes, the reason why we are not sure is because of, of, of 
of the application of the, sort of the, the meaning of the Constitution for a particular problem is that that problem was foreign to the historical situation. Mm -hmm. And so we might know what they would have done about certain analogous situations, but which one of those analogies is really applicable, um, you can't get any more out of history than is there, right? And so there are going to be times when uh, when the, the, the text ex excludes, I, I think it excludes lots of possible sure. uh, unconstitutional sure. things. Uh, but within what's left, sometimes we just don't know. And it is my view, this is not an originalist view, although it's compatible, I think, with originalism. But it's like, what do you do when history runs out? And my view is you don't try to squeeze you know, down to 5149, <laughs> when you're really doing something that doesn't really make any historical sense, um, you know, uh, instead you then ask, well, is, how has our country confronted this problem uh, over time? And so uh, uh, you, you don't stop your story at the original, right? right? You look yeah. at it over time, and you look not just at what courts have said, which precedent and stare decisis, although that's an important part of it, you also look at how uh, state legislatures have, have acted. You look how president, the, the statements presidents have made uh, and, and how Congress has, has, uh, has dealt with these problems. You know, but even then, Eric, even then, there are going to be matters that have not been resolved, either at the beginning or over time. They're clearly constitutional in the sense that it has to do with the, you know, with, with a, a terrain laid out by the sure. Constitution. Sure. But even then, we may not know the answer. And that's when, to my mind, judicial restraint should kick in. This is, in some ways, the biggest divide in constitutional interpretation. Agreed. Because at that point, I think the judges should, should just say, we have no legitimate basis for saying that what the political branch has done is unconstitutional. They can do it even if we strongly disagree with it. Now, the alternative view espoused by, you know, very distinguished people, including to some extent my former boss, uh, uh, Justice Brennan, is at that point the courts uh, decide what they think is the best answer according to their own lights maybe taking some cues from how they think the country is, although, frankly, most of the most controversial things are where they decide against what the country yes. thinks, right, in favor of what the elite thinks. But, you know, my view is, at that point, it's there's no basis for saying that what the Congress has done uh, is unconstitutional. Well, I, did, I wrote a whole book defending that view, <laughs> and I agree with that view. But then I get a little confused in other parts of your scholarship. And this is actually the very question I have always wanted to ask. you. So two of the um, pieces of scholarship you are most famous for, and deservedly so, is the um, view that maybe Brown versus Board of Education can be justified based on the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, something that very few people, frankly, agree with uh, other than you although it's fashionable for originalists who have never studied anything to, to agree with it. Um, and second, on, on, on constitutionally required religious exemptions, where you, of course, you know, are, are very famous and have written a lot about. And Michael, to me, on both of those points, after re really studying your scholarship, I think you make reasonable arguments, but I don't think you make, if I was a judge, strong enough arguments for me to overcome what I think is the clear original meaning of the... I, I think reasonable people can disagree over whether Brown can be justified as an original matter. If that's true, then I think the judges should... Your, your position is the judges should have deferred in Brown because it wasn't clear. And I don't, I don't think your scholarship suggests that it's clear. I think your scholarship suggests it is defensible. And when you read you and Hamburger on religious exemptions, and I've asked a lot of people about this, we all come away with the same thing. Man, that's a good fight. <laughs> that's a good argument. They both have really strong points. And if I'm a judge, then I'm going to say, look, 
uh, you know, McConnell might be right. Hamburger might be right. But because I'm not sure, I am not going to require state legislatures to provide exemptions, you know, to generally applicable laws. I'm hoping, I'm sure this is not going to be the case, but my wildest dream is that you say to me, your scholarship on Brown is meant to be historical as a researcher, not what a judge ought to have done in that case. But that's, that's, I'll let you answer. So let me first explain why maybe uh, this, I, I might have been less than clear when I wrote each of these things, because at the moment when I wrote each of these, I was defending long-standing Supreme Court precedent that was frequently attacked for being uh, contrary to the original understanding. So Brown was in place. Brown had been decided years, you know, decades before, and yet there were still people saying, "Oh, that's that was an Im that was an improper act by the Supreme Court because uh, that's inconsistent with the original understanding." Uh, now, Smith is in the free exercise case is more interesting because literally as my article was in page proof, the Supreme Court handed down its decision reversing its uh, longstanding uh, interpretation. And so um, I, at that point, I wasn't really telling judges, you know, how strong does this need to be in order to... Uh, in order to adopt a new doctrine, I was saying to to the legal community, stop criticizing the Supreme Court for being or acting contrary to the original understanding in these doctrines, because in fact, uh, they are um, there's a lot a lot to be said. And you know, and so I didn't need to say how much there was. I actually think that in both cases, the evidence is very powerful, and if you like to talk about the instances and what the evidence is, you know, I'm ha I'm happy to do that. I think maybe that isn't your agenda for no, uh, it's not for today. <laughs> uh, but that's that's where it was. So 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 the, okay. So let me let me do ask you one. Po thank you for that answer. One policy question that is very timely because um, I think I mean Brown's not going to be reversed. Of course, Smith might be. I think probably will be. But I have a different question. Let's talk about affirmative action for a minute. And let's go back to Mike Rappaport, who, again, I deeply respect, and I like Mike a lot. Mike wrote an article saying uh, the, the prevailing wisdom on affirmative action has been for a long time that between the Freedmen's Bureaus and other historical evidence, there is no originalist basis for overturning reasonable racial preferences in university admissions. Um, and race is not mentioned in the 14th Amendment, so it's hard to make a textual argument about it. Um, and then Mike comes along with an article that canvasses the historical, you know, and he decides it's very close, but I think it's more likely than not that the original understanding forbids them, but it's very close. If you're a judge today and you have a new affirmative action case and you're starting over, you're saying, we're going we're gonna to throw Bakke and Bruder and all those cases in the, in the we're going to look at this anew. Because frankly, there's never been a discussion, not a syllable in any Supreme Court opinion about the original meaning of the 14th Amendment from the conservative side. Scalia never did it. Thomas never did it. Not a word. I, need, I, I would like to be, I, I'm wondering if you could articulate, since you were a judge for 10 years, what kind of proof would you need to overturn an admission, uh, 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 a, a typical university affirmative action plan that takes race into account, uh, you know, in some ways, but the end result is the university is still mostly white um, and they're just trying to get peop more people of color in. What's the appropriate way for a judge to look at that? Um, I, I, this is a really hard question. Thank you. And uh, let me begin by saying that the Supreme Court's current doctrine is completely incoherent from anybody's point of view. I agree, and I have a blog because post. Well, sorry, Michael. I have a blog post yesterday and Monday saying exactly that. So we agree. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> I missed those, but. You know, the, the Supreme Court has basically said that there is one and only one uh, rationale that, for the use of affirmative action, and that is to increase diversity uh, in education. Uh, that certainly has no basis in history. It also has no basis in good sense. 
And it's also a lie, since if we really want, we're interested in diversity, we'd be interested in a whole bunch of different kinds of diversity and not just race. So, so our, our current doctrine is a complete mess. Um, now, I think that when you look at the original, the original history, let's focus just on the Freedmen's Bureau, which I think is the place where the, where the best evidence is. First point, it's by no means clear that the idea of freedmen was a racial category. These were people who had been held in slavery. If you're going to do something extraordinary on their behalf, it's entirely justified on the grounds of the experience they had just gone through. It, it, just because all of them were African of African descent doesn't um, doesn't make it a racial category because they were being legislated about uh, in their capacity as being recently uh, freed uh, enslaved people. That's point one. Point two is that in the debates over the Freedmen's Bureau Act, when the Democrats, who were the opponents of civil rights and opponents of the act, charged that the that the bill was discriminating on the basis of race, uh, the Republican response was to amend the bill and include in some of its of its uh, provisions what they call loyal refugees. That meant uh, white supporters of the Union who had been displaced by the Civil War. And so, in a sense, what they their response to this was to was to muddy the waters in much the way some affirmative action programs today uh, like to muddy the waters. Um, uh, now, it is also true, and this I think is important, uh, that the uh, 36th Congress had before it a proposal uh, for a 14th Amendment drafted by Robert Dale Owen and, and, put, uh, and, and, and backed by Thaddeus Stevens that would have been an express prohibition on discrimination on the basis of, I think that's right, did it say race, color, or previous condition of servitude, uh, which would not have applied the 14th Amendment to other categories of irrational discrimination and would have presumably been a much more ironclad, colorblind uh, uh, provision and the Congress rejected that in favor of John Bingham's, I think, much more difficult to understand and perhaps more ambiguous uh, uh, of, of formulations. That also tells us something that maybe colorblindness, although they still speak so often in terms of colorblindness, it's like it, it's obvious that that's a, a major kind of undercurrent in the in their sense of the justice of the matter. Uh, but I don't think that that was meant to be embodied in a uh, in a hard and fast uh, rule. Um, and so much as I actually rather dislike um, the the some of the, uh, the the current doctrine based part of what it says, putting aside the diversity, which is really silly. Uh, the I mean the the the, the focus only on e uh, educational diversity is really. Uh, boundless. The other feature of the court's jurisprudence here is that uh, it's okay to discriminate as much as you want, as long as you as you do it in terms of euphemisms and fuzziness and right. uh, uh, and highly subjective stuff. And so that, I just find that really I don't really understand who's for that. I you know it, it doesn't seem to satisfy any theory of justice that I'm or any theory of text that I'm aware of. Um, but I have to say, sometimes the Reconstruction Congress seemed to uh, follow that course too. It may be the political uh, line of least resistance. Well, for what it's worth, it's my theory. You said who would be for that. The answer is very clear. And this is what I've just been writing about. The answer is Justice Powell. Um, because Justice Powell's Bakke opinion, though not really binding on anybody, um, was horrific. In, in all the things you've mentioned, and then Justice O'Connor embraces that because she likes Justice Powell in 2003, and somehow Justice Kennedy goes along as he walks out the door. Um, Michael, I have one more question about affirmative action, one more question about originalism, and then we'll get to your book, I promise. Um, to me, UC Davis went to the Supreme Court and said there is, for a whole set of reasons, 
way too few people of color in medical school on a national basis and at our medical school. And this is a problem for society for a lot of reasons, including underserved communities. We have 100 seats. We are going to reserve 16 of those to help address that problem, which has been going on for centuries, that there's not enough minority doctors. Justice Power rejects that out of hand, just out of hand, and says, you're not allowed to do that. Um, and it strikes me from that point forward, we have to make stuff up. Because, because the, the diversity thing is a made-up thing. University of Michigan Law School didn't care about diversity for Hispanics or Native Americans. They only cared about it really for African Americans. Um, and, and I think if Justice Powell had not rejected those out of hand, those asserted interests, at least we could then have an honest conversation about whether it's worth it to use racial preferences to redress what is obviously a history of apartheid, slavery, segregation. That's my theory. And, I, and, and, and for Powell to reject that out of hand, from a legal realist point of view, you know that's where I come from, this Southern gentleman who was a pretty good guy, um, but to his way of thinking, the idea that, that you know, we would admit to our past in that way and then let medical schools act on it, he just couldn't handle it. And I think from there on, it's been downhill ever since. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's my... Actually, I not only makes sense, but I totally agree with that as a diagnosis of the problem. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 but you are describing a major uh, school of interpretive thought. It may not have as catchy a name as originalism. <laughs> I mean, but it's sometimes called common, uh, common law constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. It goes by a number of, and the idea is that uh, if you build on Supreme Court decisions and, and, and the more radical version of this is you build on them to sort of leap to the next, slightly more small C conservative. I don't mean right wing, but yes, yes. cautious, Burkean conservative version. You take little steps, but basically you take where the uh, Supreme Court starts out and then you, and, and then you uh, uh, carry on. Uh, that's exactly what you're describing here. They start out for whatever reason, usually, I mean, Lewis Powell happened to be the middle justice, mm -hmm. and then it just gets more and more absurd uh, as they uh, as they build on that, rather than going back and asking whether their starting point was uh, was sensible. I think one of the virtues of originalism uh, from a, I'm going to say, from a legal realist point of view, let's let's put aside whether it's actually a, in an abstract way, the best way to read the Constitution. One of its virtues is that it drives us to ask the question: Well, is where we are right now? Does it bear any resemblance to the actual Constitution? And 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 maybe we should uh, we should take a few steps yeah. back and. And, and have that kind of honest conversation you're talking about. And again, I don't have any problem with the idea of let's seriously consider whether we should depart from that, mm -hmm. but but for good reasons and and be, and, and not just because uh, we've got this string of cases. The affirmative action cases are a disgrace in the sense that they never grapple with the serious arguments of either side. Agreed. Right? It's Agreed. like. It's just um, it, it's it's a series of it, it actually and, and and in the relation to the Constitution, it reminds me of you know the kids' game telephone, uh, where one person yes. whispers yes. in the ear of the next one something, and then they try to repeat it, and and it goes around the room, and by the end, with everybody doing their level best, their good faith effort to repeat what <laughs> yes. they heard. In the end, you know, you begin by saying elephant and you end up by saying, uh, you know, with, with Australia or something, you know, that has no relation. Um, that's what common law constitutionalism is all about. I, I right? agree with that. Uh, we're opposed to it for, I think, maybe different reasons, but I agree with that. One last thing about this that I, I have found, this is going to sound really arrogant, and I don't mean it to sound this way. I know many constitutional law professors who don't know what I'm about to say which is, so, so Grutter is the 2003 case with Justice O'Connor writes for four, the four liberals and her upholding the law school's plan. It's companion case the same day as Gratz strikes down the college's plan. You can't possibly reconcile those two cases in any reasonable world. Justice Breyer, <laughs> Gratz is not 5'4". Gratz is 6'3". I'm telling you, I've talked to a lot of con law professors who don't know that. 
Justice Powell, I'm sorry, Justice Breyer drops a footnote in Gratz, agreeing with O'Connor's concurring opinion, but, but in a very limited way, and agreeing with Ginsburg's dissenting opinion in every way, except for the result, which is a very strange sentence for a Supreme Court justice to write. And my theory has always been, and I think I'm right about this, he did that because in 2003 America, we were, even though Justice Kennedy was just as much a swing vote, we were living in Justice O'Connor's America. That's Jeffrey Rosen's phrase. And the whole world was watching Justice O'Connor. Breyer and O'Connor went around the country for two years on the local, back then there were just morning news shows, um, as friends and, and playing up the Supreme Court and all the, and I believe he did that so they wouldn't be 5-4, five, 5-4, four, five, four, O'Connor being the swing vote in both cases. And that's just not something judges ought to do. That's my opinion. Um, and, and it's amazing to me how few law professors know Gratz is 6-3. It's not a 5-4 case. And Breyer then it dissents in parents involved as strongly as possible. And it's clear he is, uh, he is absolutely in favor of affirmative action, which again makes one scratch their, their head. Why would he strike down the college's, you know, anyway. I, I hate it when Supreme Court justices do that. And it's why, in my opinion, the court's not a court because that's something judges ought not to do. I have one more, if, if, if I know I'm trying your patience, but I have one more originalism question, and it's, a, it, it's, my, it's my biggest one. Actually. Well, maybe, maybe you should invite me back next week uh, to For talk about the book. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to <laughs> I'm this happy this won't to take long. These are important questions you're raising. Well, I think this next one is the most timely originalism question there is. You're one of your mentees, someone I really like, and I think you really like, Elan Werman, who's at Arizona State right now, and I believe worked for you, right? He, was, he worked for the Con Law Center. Is that right? Uh, no, but he was a student. of. Mine. I'm sorry. Okay, former student. In his book on originalism, he writes the following sentence. Originalists recognize that original meaning often requires that the application of the text evolve as modern circumstances evolve. Larry Solemn, last quote for the day, I promise. Larry Solemn who is considered one of the leading academic originalists of our time. Quote, in Bradwell versus Illinois, it's a 19th century case, the Supreme Court upheld Myra Bradwell's exclusion from the Illinois bar on the basis of gender. Bradwell could have been understood as consistent with the 14th Amendment by justices who believed women were intellectually incapable of functioning as competent lawyers. The opposite result would be required today and here's the key sentence. Fixed original public meaning can give rise to different outcomes given changing beliefs about facts. Not changing facts. Changing beliefs about facts. That's Larry Solom. Uh, Ilya Soman has said the same thing. Randy Barnett has said the same thing. And I am just curious what you think of the idea that one can call oneself an originalist say there is an original meaning, which Solemn says, it's the fixation principle, but then say judges can change the application of that meaning if views about facts change. As long as we really take seriously the word facts as opposed to the word judgments, let me give an example. Uh, let's imagine that there was a statute passed that allows quarantine of people with infectious diseases, and it was passed in 1820. And let's imagine that in 1820, they thought, what's a good example? Cancer. Let's say in 1820, people thought cancer was an infectious disease, and so they were quarantining people with cancer. Well, today, we don't have to amend that statute in order to say... Sure. Well, no, cancer sure. does this and included. We, we now know that, uh, that cancer isn't infectious. Now, you say opinions about facts. The truth is we never have anything other than opinions <laughs> about facts. That's true. We don't know the world. We have, a, we, have, we have experts and we have various, we have, and so I, as long as that's what we're talking about, fine. I think the, the Bradwell case is not a very good example, though. You and me both. Because <laughs> the... The three, uh, the three, there were three concurring justices who uh, based their decision on what they regarded was the 
uh, intellectual unfitness of women to practice law. But they were only three of them. The actual basis for the Bradwell decision uh, was that practicing law is not a privilege or immunity of citizens, and therefore uh, the uh, it, it doesn't matter whether what you think about women or not. It's just that's she did not have a right under the privileges and immunities clause to practice uh, to practice law, and 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 that's I think perfectly consistent. Just as somebody from Indiana would not have had a right to practice law in Illinois. Uh, even though the Article 4 Privileges and Immunities Clause um, uh, prohibits discrimination with respect to privileges and immunities uh, on the basis of out-of-state citizenship. Uh, so uh, I, I think that, you know, I, much as I admire Larry Solomon, I think his choice of example there is highly misleading. Yeah, and I, and, and I think that the methodology described is very hard to distinguish from Justice Brennan or Phil Bobbitt or anybody else who, um, but, but you know what, I, I know you have answers to that, but let's go to your book. Let's go to your book. I, I, um, can you, so again, the book is, I love, I just love this title. Um, the President Who Would Not Be King, Executive Power Under the Constitution. Is there a way you, for you, you know to where summarize? I got the title? I'm sorry? You know what the, you know where the title comes from? Uh, you know, it, it always rang a bell with me, but I, I don't, I can't put my finger on it. So there was a very popular movie with Sean Connery. The Man Who Would Not Be King. Uh, yeah, The Man Who Would Not Be King. The Man Who Would Not yeah. Be King. So this, the president yeah. who would not be king. And also it so fits because at the very first debate, and I think a very dramatic moment at the Constitutional Convention, when the Virginia plan uh, plank for executive power came before them, the very first speaker was you know, 20 something uh, uh, Charles Pinckney from South Carolina. And he basically goes, you know, that will, but, but that will create a, a, a king. You know, that'll make this a monarchy. Right. So right. is it possible for the purposes of, you know, a podcast to, to summarize the essential thesis of the book? Well, you know, a lot of it is simply trying to get the his history straight. And it's hard to say a single thesis. But but yeah, let me try. So um, I believe that the uh, powers of the president were put together by largely behind closed doors by the committee of detail, and, there, and therefore we have to you know suss this out from what they did from successive drafts rather than from any direct uh, uh, statements. But I think that what they did is they began from an understanding of executive power based on the powers of the king as set forth in Blackstone. And if depending on how you count, I, I think there are roughly 41 separate powers that Blackstone identifies and talks about. And all but one of those is either explicitly or very by strong implication dealt with uh, in the Constitution. I do not think that was an accident. And I think the principal device that they used was to allocate many of those powers uh, to Congress, even though they had been royal prerogative powers uh, under the British system, and still were for the most part as of 1787, um, give those to Congress. An example of that, and then, and then you leave most than the sort of residuum of executive power uh, you can give to the president, and, and it's not going to be very dangerous because all the important things have already been sort of deliberately given to allocate it in one way uh, or another. And you know, the clearest and I think most important example of this is the Declare War Clause, because as of 1787, the king had a unilateral power to take the country into war. He also had the unilateral power to make peace. And, and this is what Charles Pinckney referred to. He said, why that would give the executive the powers of war and peace, and that would make him a king. So those were the very examples that started Pinckney and set off the whole, uh, the whole debate. Well, how did they deal with that? They dealt with it by saying, by, by writing a clause that says, the Congress has the power 
uh, first to make war. That was the language of the of the uh, Committee of Detail, and and that means to initiate, to go into war. It doesn't mean that there was some there was debate. One one of the delegates says that, that that's I don't like the word make because it might imply that Congress also you know makes the decisions about engaging in war, like what a commander in chief should do. So what they did is changed it to declare war, meaning the Congress has the authority to initiate. I think that would have been a better word. That was Hamilton's word, by the way. Hamilton said initiate. I love Hamilton. You know that. He's my favorite. So they say Congress starts the war and then through the commander in chief clause, uh, the president uh, conducts the war once begun. That was also Hamilton's language, which would have been a better, uh, which would have been a little bit uh, clearer. Uh, so, but the, my point here, though, is that in order to understand the powers of the president, you don't just look at Article Two and what was given to him. The most important thing to do is to look at Article One and what was taken away from him. That is to say, from the exec, from the body of executive powers uh, that we have identified uh, as a result of the British uh, experience, and so. Um, that's the overall uh, uh, point. And then, you know, toward the end, I explain why I think that the Supreme Court has actually adopted a completely different way of looking at it that I think leads to uh, all kinds of ambiguities and actually is, a, is an inv- invitation uh, to, the, uh, to the president to uh, assume authorities that the Constitution, properly read, uh, don't give to him. As part of a Twitter discussion yesterday, not anticipating this conversation, I, we were joking around and I said, we need much more Article One-ism and much less Article Two and Article Three-ism. <laughs> that's what I said yesterday. Absolutely. And that's true not just of constitutional interpretation, but also of political practice. Yes. Our biggest pro- part of our problem is that the presidents have usurped power in a variety of ways. But the much bigger problem is that Congress has abdicated power and, and, and just acquiesces and, and doesn't give a peep when presidents do things that are, um, that are unconstitutional. Uh, again, I hate to mention the same example twice, but when, when uh, President Obama initiated a war against Libya, I happened to be at a, in a to see uh, the uh, Speaker of the House, like a day or two later, a Republican. Yeah. And I said to him, uh, you know that there's no, uh, that this is like a really easy <laughs> example of, this is unconstitutional. There's no basis for this. Um, I, I hope you're going to do something about that. <laughs> and he didn't literally pat me on the head and say a little more <laughs> cold. <laughs> Uh, go back to your uh, to your toys, but uh, effectively, it was obvious to me that that the, they did not want to raise the constitutional question. And the reason it is just so convenient for Congress to let the president act, and then if it's popular, they can help, they can share the credit. Right. And if it goes south, they can then complain. And much of the reason that it makes so much sense to give Congress the power to go to war is so that they're on the hook, right? It isn't for their benefit. Giving powers to Congress is, we don't do that so that congressmen are better off. We do that so that, the, so that we have clear lines of accountability and deliberation. And I want them to be on the hook. <laughs> Me too. Just, I want them to go to war less often, but when they do go to war, I want them to support the war, and then let's win it. Let's not yeah. go into things in such a half-assed way. The incident you mentioned, Michael, um, is interesting to me. For no, I think you're right. I, we agree on all of this. We agree on most things, which is kind of weird, but we do. Um, but you know, Harold Coe, who I have enormous respect for, and and is a law professor at Yale and was working for Obama at the time. Our system is so messed up that it made him say something unbelievably stupid. And he's not a stupid man. I mean, there's no one who would think he's a stupid man. And the justification after the fact for all of this was we didn't have boots on the ground. We were dropping bombs from the sky. And so Americans were not in danger. And then somehow that wasn't a war, which suggests launching a nuclear weapon with a 
press of a button is not launching a war. How could someone that smart say something? I don't think I miss. I don't think I'm mischaracterizing what he said. How can someone that smart say something that dumb? It's right. He didn't just say it like in a tweet or something. Right. It's actually early in the written opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That lack of bo- lack, lack of troops on the ground yes. Um, yes. makes a difference. Well, in the book, um, just again, I want to tout the book for a second. Hold it up. If you have it, hold it up. I'm sorry. I don't have it. With, with respect to each of these clauses, what I do is I go back and talk about the British background that they came into the convention with. But then I also talk about the major conflicts uh, that arose in usually the Washington, but up through sometimes as far as the Jefferson Mm -hmm. uh, administration to see how they dealt with the ambiguities and so forth. So with respect to war, I just think it's so interesting. The first two wars that we were involved in, one under Adams, one under Jefferson, neither of them declared, uh, but... um, in both cases, the uh, president concluded that he could not continue uh, uh, sending American forces uh, in, into conflict without getting a, 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 an authorization for use of military force, which in my opinion is just as good as, as a formal declaration, mm-hmm. right? But both of those were entirely naval wars. Oh, interesting. No, no boots on the ground. <laughs> yeah. So both Adams and Jefferson, and I might add Hamilton, too, who wrote an, uh, an opinion that, for Adams, all of them agreed that those, were, uh, that those required congressional authorization with no boots on the ground. So, you know, in, in my uh, little originalist world <laughs> if you've got adams jefferson and hamilton on one side and harold co on the other side i'm going <laughs> to go with Moulton adam jefferson but yes and this issue though i don't think one needs to be an originalist to understand the wisdom the incredible wisdom of separating the war um fighting function from the war declaring function which is i which i know they wanted to do because those who fight wars like to go to war. Um, and, and if they're the ones who get to decide, that's a real problem. And my understanding is there are statements by the founders about that, that they wanted to split that power up. That just makes sense, right? I mean, Undoubtedly, they understood. Actually, I think they may have even exaggerated the extent to which the commander-in-chief would benefit politically from going to war. Yeah. What they had in mind, the, 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 the evil incident that they were thinking about the most was Julius Caesar, (laughs) who goes off to war, commands the armies, has this wonderful victory against the Gauls, you know, comes back, and his soldiers love him, and the people adore him. And under the Roman constitution, the general has to leave his armies across a, a particular river, the Rubicon, right? It's unconstitutional to bring the troops into Rome for obvious reasons, right? Really good reasons, right? But he goes, he crosses the Rubicon, and next thing you know, the the Republic is at an end, and it's an authoritarian military dictatorship. Right. Um, So they they were, there was probably, I don't think there was a single issue that they were as more concerned about uh, than, uh, than that. And the... And the protections that they built in uh, to try to ward against that were intricate, and many of them we've just completely forgotten. Yeah. Uh, for example, yeah. the, the commander-in-chief clause is very careful uh, that the the militias of the states are not under the command of the president except in certain narrow circumstances declared by Congress. Right now, why does that matter? Militias. Who cares about militias? At the time, the militias of the states were the primary military force of the United States. That standing army, of which the president is always commander in chief, had under Washington had fewer than a thousand men, most of them stationed on the frontier. Meanwhile, every state had a militia of uh, it, 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 
of uh, you know tens of thousands of trained uh, uh, people, and that meant that the president, unlike Julius Caesar, who had like basically the entire military apparatus at his disposal, the president of the United States would not. And right. So it becomes almost right. impossible for a president, by virtue of his head of being head of the army, uh, to turn the country into a dictatorship. Yeah. Um, when it, whenever I hear that Rubicon quote, it's forever polluted in, polluted in my head by Justice Kennedy, right before Casey coming, right before Casey comes out having a yeah. Right, there was a reporter in Kennedy's chambers as they were basically walking out to announce the Casey decision. And he basically said, I don't know if I forget the exact quote, but he, he uses that quote and says, I don't know which side of this is on, I'm on. I'm doing the best I can. And he says it to a reporter who, who reports that he said that. And I think Kennedy did that because I believe he was truly conflicted. And I think he wanted the world to know he was truly conflicted. Michael, do we have time for me to ask you one more big question about executive power? Can I just? I do. OK. Um, so the New Deal. Um, and not just the New Deal, but the New Deal going forward all the way up into today. I think one would have to be, a, it's obvious that is not consistent with the original meaning of the original Constitution. Um, is that more a problem for Congress? To me, people always blame the regulatory state and the president, but I actually blame Congress. I, I, I mean, not many people give power back. <laughs> it's not a thing government officials Certainly, the Supreme Court has never done that, and it's not something that, that we let that, that that we let that government officials do as a matter of course. Is it the, to the extent one thinks that the current administrative state is both inconsistent with the original meaning and a bad idea? Shouldn't we blame Congress? Is it really the president's fault? Uh, so, uh, the, I'm not sure whether there are two problems here that are not the same. Okay, one has to do with the extent of regulatory authority over the economy way down even to the, yeah. you know, to the corner yeah. drugstore, right? That's a, an extent of power problem. And then there is the unaccountability of the administrative apparatus through independent agencies and a number of other things too, like uh, the, allowing them to judge their own case without going to court. Uh, yeah. There are a lot, of, a lot of things that make the administrative agencies uh, impervious to democratic accountability. Those are two quite different problems. The first problem plainly belongs to Congress, but frankly, it belongs to the people. Um, I do not think that the people oppose that increase in power. And it's, so it may be one of those instances in which judicial restraint uh, uh, you know, is going to kick in, mm -hmm. and it's hard to know exactly. We could talk. We could do a whole yes. other segment on yes. the yes. scope yes. of the commerce power. Yeah. And I just, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the but the administrative state side of it, some of the blame has to be given to the United States Supreme Court, because um, in, at at the very beginning of the Roosevelt administration, the question of independent agencies came to the court, right. They had a pretty clear, I mean, it was a 120-page, loaded, confusing opinion uh, by Chief Justice Tapp, but pretty clear uh, that um, administra adm independent administrative agencies aren't part of our system. Uh, that goes to, uh, that was Roosevelt's view. He tries to fire uh, somebody uh, who is a, a commissioner of a regulatory agency, and he defends the administration defends that, uh, and the Supreme Court goes the other way. Uh, um, so, in a, in a sense, the Supreme Court is opposing the New Deal. One of the it's ironic that one of the characteristic features of what we think of as the New Deal was actually something Franklin Roosevelt disagreed with. That is which interesting. Is the, it is because he thought that the, the regulatory apparatus ought to be under his control. A view, by the way, that he shared with Ronald Reagan. <laughs> is it too late to go back? Like, is, I, I think it is, but is it too late to go back? I, we can cut it back here and there, but. On the first part, I think it's too late. And, and, and it's by no means clear that we can even operate as a, you know, as a modern economy. Going back 
uh, had they not done it the way they did, we might very well have had a constitutional amendment anyway. Yeah. I, I think trying to reverse all of that would be... A, as to the structure of the administrative agencies, I think we could at least go back a good bit. And uh, I think this, I don't know, I think this may be one of the projects of people like Kavanaugh and Gorsuch going forward. And um, and note that it will now, the political valence of this will change because before it was, you know, to, to uh, increase the power of the president over the unelected bureaucracy meant Trump before now it means biden yeah. and it may not seem so scary to uh, uh uh to people so you know what happens if biden fires you know the head of the postal service or one of the other uh, trump uh holdovers uh who is ostensibly uh independent uh my guess is that a lot of the cheering squads on both sides are going to change their tune. It's amazing how that how often that happens, how often flip sides. And my theory about that is our Supreme Court in general, not on this issue, just does way too much. And we rely on it way too much. And it would be a lot better if um, we didn't do that. But that's a whole different that's a whole different podcast and a whole different conversation. Michael, thank you so much for doing this. It was so great to have this time with you. I've, I've been wanting to do it for a long time. And I really it's appreciate it. Have me back. I definitely will. Um, um, and I just want to say, People should read, liberals and progressives specifically, should read your scholarship. And I don't say that, frankly, about a whole lot of people. But I, if you're listening to this and you think, you know, you know who Michael McConnell is, you probably don't. And two, there is something in your scholarship, I think, for everybody. And that's, there's no one else on this show, on this podcast, sorry, I've said that too. And, and you're the 27th person. So um, I, I really appreciate your work. Thank you. I consider that a real compliment, but I do. I think academics need to um, be less partisan. I agree. Thank you very much. Mike.